not consistent with a conservative vision for the country. I don't think we should be sending the federal police in to arrest a mother and separate them from their child for giving a medicine to their child for and, seizures. And Jake, I'm I'm not, I want to bring, I wanna bring in Ms. Fiorina. I want to bring in Ms. Fiorina in this issue. I very much hope that I am the only person on this stage who can say this, but I know there are millions of Americans out there who will say the same thing. My husband, Frank, and I buried a child to drug addiction. So we must invest more in the treatment of drugs. I agree with Senator Paul. I agree with states' rights. But we are misleading young people when we tell them that marijuana is just like having a beer. It's not. And the marijuana that kids are smoking today is not the same as the marijuana that Jeb Bush smoked 40 years ago. We do. We Sorry, we Barbara. We do need, we do need criminal justice reform. We have the highest incarceration rates in the world. Two-thirds of the people in our prisons are there for nonviolent offenses, mostly drug-related. It's clearly not working. But we need to tell young people the truth. Drug addiction is an epidemic, and it is taking too many of our young people. I know this, sadly, from personal experience. Hugh Hewitt, I'd like to... Thank you, Jake. Tomorrow is, uh, Republicans know this, tomorrow is Constitution Day. We've been talking about the Tenth Amendment. Let's talk about the Second Amendment. Governor Bush, one of the things the Supreme Court has gotten right is that it's an individual right. It's protected for individuals to hold it. Last week you said the next step in gun issues is to make sure they're not in the hands of the mentally ill. In this state, there's a controversial law that allows guns to be taken away from people without a hearing. Where does it go, and the problem of violence is endemic, but where does it go from what you said last week, how far into people's lives to take guns away from them? Not very far. I think we need to do this state by state. Uh, there are places that get this right, and we need to make sure that we protect the privacy laws. This is a complicated place. But I do think uh, the natural impulse on the left, Hillary Clinton, immediately after uh, one of these horrific violent acts took place, immediately said we need to have federal gun laws. President Obama, almost reflexively, always says the same thing. And the net result is you're going to take away rights of, of law-abiding citizens, the 99.999% of the people that are law-abiding citizens. That's not the right approach to do it. In Florida, we have a background check. We have concealed weapon permit holders. In fact, there's a million two hundred thousand of them. We have a reduction in violent crime because we put people behind bars when they use a gun in the commission of a crime. That's the better approach. But we're living in a society today where despair kind of grows in isolation. If a family member calls and says, my child, my brother, my sister is disturbed, ought the state be able to go and get their weapon without a hearing? I, th I think there needs to be a hearing. But the fact is, we need to encourage that kind of uh, involvement. That's, that's exactly what we need to do. Here, Hugh, and there's a broader issue here as well. First of all, the only people that follow the law are law-abiding people. Mm -hmm. Criminals, by definition, ignore the law. So you can pass all the gun laws in the world like the left wants. The criminals are going to ignore it because they are criminals. Here's the real issue. The real issue, the real issue is not why, what are people using to commit violence, but why are they committing the violence. And here's the truth. Because you cannot separate the social, moral well-being of your people from their economic and other well-being. You cannot separate it. You can't have a strong country without strong people. You cannot have strong people without strong values. And you cannot have strong values without strong families and the institutions in this country that defend and support those Thank families. You, well, and today we have a left-wing government under this president that is undermining all of the institutions in society that support the family and teach those values. Senator Cruz, I wanted to go to you. You're a constitutional litigator. Are you afraid of the next step theory of what happens to Second Amendment rights? I, I am not. And, and you mentioned that the U.S. Supreme Court had right, rightly upheld the individual right to keep and bear arms. I was proud to lead 31 states before the U.S. Supreme Court defending the Second Amendment, and we won that landmark victory. And indeed, just a couple of years ago, when Harry Reid and Barack Obama came after the right to keep and bear arms of millions of Americans. I was proud to lead the fight in the United States Senate to protect our right to keep and bear arms. And for that reason, you, I was honored to be endorsed by Gun Owners of America Thank as you, the strongest supporter of the Second Amendment on this stage today. And Thank I will you, fight every day I'd like to, to turn defend to, the Bill I'd like of to rights. turn to Dana Bash. You, Mr. Trump, you have said once or twice that you are really rich, and you are by far the richest person on this stage. Uh, Chris Christie says billionaires like you, and even people who make and, and earn far less, 
should no longer get Social Security, or at least there should be limits based on the, on the income. You think he's wrong? And if so, why? Speaking my, for myself, I'm okay with it. I think there's a certain truth to it. I know people that, frankly, it has no impact on their life whatsoever. There are many people. I would almost say leave it up to them, but I would be willing to check it off and say I will not get Social Security. What about I the do country not as a, as a policy. As a policy, I would almost leave it up to the people. Don't forget, they pay in and they pay in, and maybe they do well, and maybe some people want it. But the fact is that there are people that truly don't need it, and there are many people that do need it very, very badly. And I would be willing to write mine off 100 percent, Dana. So is a voluntary program a way to get the Social Security system solvent again like that? No, it's not. But with Donald in it, it's a good start. That's really good. <laughs> um, I, no, listen, <laughs> this is an issue that that we've got to talk about and we haven't talked about yet. 71 percent of all federal spending is on entitlements and debt service. When John Kennedy was elected president in 1960, it was 26 percent. Harvard and Dartmouth says that Social Security is going to go insolvent in seven to eight years. So what I say is very simple. We need to save this program for the good people out there who have paid into the system and need it. And if that means making sure that folks like Donald and many of us on this stage don't get it, that's the right thing to do, because here's what Hillary Clinton's going to want to do. She's going to want to put more money into a system that has already lied to us and stolen from us. This government doesn't need more money to make Social Security solvent. We need to be not paying out benefits to people who don't really need it. We need to protect the people whose Social Security means the difference between picking between heat and rent and food. That's why I put out the proposal, and that's the people I'm thank trying you, to Governor. Governor Christie's thank right you, about Social Security. Thank you, Governor. Medicare. I'm coming to you right now on a separate issue, well, sir. We've received, issue rec Monica. received a lot of questions from social media about climate change. Senator Rubio, Ronald Reagan's uh, Secretary of State, George Shultz, reminds us that when Reagan was president, he faced a similar situation to the one that we're facing now. There were dire warnings from the mass consensus of the scientific community about the ozone layer shrinking. Shultz says, Ronald Reagan urged skeptics in industry to come up with a plan. He said, do it as an insurance policy in case the scientists are right. The scientists were right. Reagan and his approach worked. Secretary Shultz asks, why not take out an insurance policy and approach climate change the Reagan way? Because we're not going to destroy our economy the way the left-wing government to under, that we are under now wants to do. I'm we're citing not George Shultz. Well, I, I, I don't, he may have lined up with their positions on this issue, but here's the bottom line. Every proposal they put forward are going to be proposals that will make it harder to do business in America, that will make it harder to create jobs in America. Single parents are already struggling across this country to provide provide for their families. Maybe a billionaire here in California can, can afford an increase in their utility rates, but a working family in Tampa, Florida, or anywhere across this country cannot afford it. So we are not going to destroy our economy. We are not going to make America a harder place to create jobs in order to pursue policies that will do absolutely nothing, nothing, to change our economy, to, to change our climate, to change our weather, because America is a lot of things. The greatest country in the world, absolutely. But America is not a planet. And we are, we are not even the largest carbon producer anymore, China is. And they're drilling a hole and digging anywhere in the world that they can get a hold of. So the bottom line is, I am not in favor of any policies that make America a harder place for people to live or to work or to raise their families. Governor Christie, you have said that climate change is real and that humans help contribute to it without getting into the issue of China versus the United States, which I understand uh, you've talked about before. What do you make of skeptics of climate change, such as Senator Rubio? I don't think Senator Rubio is a skeptic of climate change. I think what Senator Rubio said, I agree with. That, in fact, we don't need this massive government intervention to deal with the problem. Look at what we've done in New Jersey. Um, we've already reached our clean air goals for 2020. And when I was governor, I pulled out of the regional cap and trade deal, the only state in the Northeast that did that. And we still reached our goals. Why? Because 53 percent of our electricity comes from nuclear. We use natural gas. We use solar power. We're the third highest using solar power state. You know why? Because we made all of those things economically feasible. I agree with Marco. We shouldn't be destroying our economy in order to chase some wild left wing idea that somehow us by ourselves is going to fix the climate. We can contribute to that and be economically sound. We've proven that we could do that in New Jersey. Nuclear needs to be back on the table in a significant way in this country if we want to go after this problem. Just Thank for the you. record, Thank I was you. cititing Secretary of State George Schultz, Ronald Reagan, Secretary of State. Yeah, who I, you, I don't I, think I anybody understand. would call him left no, wing. No, no, listen, and I, listen, everybody makes a mistake every once in a while, Jake, even George Schultz. And if that's truly a representation of what he believes we should be doing, then with all due respect to the former Secretary of State, I disagree with him. Jake, you mentioned me and called me a denier. Let me say climate change. I called you a skeptic. Okay. Okay, a skeptic. You know, you can measure the climate. You can measure it. 
That's not the issue we're, being, we're discussing. Here's what I'm skeptical of. I'm skeptical of the, deci of the decisions that the left wants us to make. Because I know the impact those are going to have, and they're all going to be on our economy. They will not do a thing to lower the rise of the sea. They will not do a thing to cure the drought here in California. But what they will do is they will make America a more expensive place to create jobs. And today, with millions of people watching this broadcast that are struggling paycheck to paycheck, that do not know how they're going to pay their bills at the end of this month, I am not in favor of anything that is going to make it harder for them to raise their families. Thank, thank you, Senator. Jake, a lot of, Jake, a lot of, a lot I want to go to another question Jake, right now. A lot of, Jake, a lot of, a, I want to go to another question. I'm, Jake, okay, a lot Jake, of those I'm, people, I'm, though, and, and, and I'm going to echo what Senator Rubio just said. This is an issue where we're talking about in my state, it's thousands of manufacturing jobs. Thousands of manufacturing jobs for a rule the Obama administration, as Owens EPA has said, will have a marginal impact on climate change. So we're going to put thousands and thousands of jobs in my state. I think it's something like 30,000 in Ohio, other states across this country. We're going to put people, manufacturing jobs, the kind of jobs that are far greater than minimum wage, this administration is willing to put at risk for something its own EPA says is marginal. Thank you, Governor. This Jake, is what you thank you, Governor. Skeptic, I'm turning to, I'm turning skeptic, to another Jake, issue right now. I'm turning, to, I'm, turning to another, real I'm turning to another issue so right now, Senator skip. Cruz. I, well, I think we've heard from several this evening. A backlash against <laughs> vaccines was blamed for a measles outbreak here in California. Dr. Carson. Donald Trump has publicly and repeatedly linked vaccines, childhood vaccines, to autism, which, as you know, the medical community adamantly disputes. You're a pediatric neurosurgeon. Should Mr. Trump stop saying this? Well, let me put it this way. There, has been, there have been numerous studies, and they have not demonstrated uh, that there's any correlation between vaccinations and autism. Uh, this was something that was uh, spread widely 15 or 20 years ago. And it has not been adequately, uh, you know, revealed to the public what's actually going on. Vaccines are very important, certain ones, the ones that would prevent death or crippling. There are others, there are a multitude of vaccines which probably don't fit in that category, and there should be some discretion in those cases. But, you know, a lot of this is, is, is pushed by big government, and I think that's one of the things that people so vehemently uh, want to get rid of big government. You know, we have 4.1 million federal employees, 650 federal agencies and departments. That's why they have to take so much of our taxes. Should he stop saying it? Should he stop saying the vaccines cause autism? Well, you know, I've just explained it to him. Uh, he can read about it if he wants to. I think he's an intelligent man and will make the correct decision after getting the real facts. Mr. Trump, as president, well, I'd, you would... I'd like to, I'd like I'm to going respond. right to you. I'd like Mr. To Trump, as president, you would be in charge of the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health, both of which say you are wrong. How would you handle this as president? Autism has become an epidemic. 25 years ago, 35 years ago, you look at the statistics, not even close. It has gotten totally out of control. I am totally in favor of vaccines, but I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. Because you take a baby in, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and I had my children taken care of over a long period of time, over a two or three year period of time, same exact amount. But you take this little beautiful baby and you pump, I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. And we've had so many instances, people that worked for me just the other day, Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. I only say it's not, I'm in favor of vaccines. Do them over a longer period of time, same amount. Thank but you. Just in, in little sections. Dr. Car I Dr. Think, Carson. And I think you're going to have, I think you're going to see a big impact on autism. Dr. Carson, you just heard his medical take. <laughs> He's an okay doctor. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, we have extremely well-documented proof that there's no autism associated with vaccinations. But it is true that we are probably giving way too many in too short a period of time. And a lot of pediatricians now recognize that and I think are cutting down on the number and the proximity in which those are done. And, and that's, I think all that's, saying, that's, that's all Paul? I'm saying, Jake. That's all I'm saying. Dr. Paul, I'd like to bring you in. <laughs> A second opinion? <laughs>
one of the greatest one of the greatest medical discoveries